Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's my job to make sure you don't fall asleep straight after lunch, because they're a bit of a sleepy slot, this one, sometimes. Um, so this is an interesting project for us, actually. Um, for me personally, in fact, because I commute from South Manchester, where I live, to Huddersfield quite regularly. Uh, and this project was carried out for Network Rail, the Trans-Pennine um, Route Upgrades project. Um, and what we were looking at is increasing curving speeds um, through adopting exceptional design values. Um, and what that means for some people that aren't so familiar with that sort of terminology, most of you will be, of course, but that means that we're, we're moving away from our typical uh, cant design rules of um, maximum cant efficiency of 110 millimetres and moving up to 150 millimetres of cant efficiency. So that's not normal practice for UK railway operations, and Network Rail wanted to understand the effect of those changes on passenger comfort. Um, so this affects the transitions and also the steady state curves and also the response of the vehicle to track alignment features. So really what we're doing here is trying to assure the, the track design team that these changes aren't going to have a detrimental in, in, impact on passenger comfort. Uh, the work's carrying on at the moment. We've completed one tranche of uh, curve sites um, and the work has embodied some literature review work. For those that have looked at passenger comfort in the past, British Rail Research did a lot of work um, in the 70s and 80s, used um, uh, probably a coach of 50, 60 people responding to ride comfort events and sort of giving an index of whether they thought it was comfortable or not. And a lot of that went into the EN standards that we use today. But in essence, when you use those EN standards, um, you get a number out or you get an index that says comfortable, quite comfortable, not that comfortable, really not comfortable at all sort of thing. So it is still quite subjective, really. And for every route, every rail, every rail system is different. Um, so what we wanted to do really was say, OK, for this route, what is the ride like? Um, we get some numbers out of simulations, but what do they really mean? And so this work really is trying to understand what do the numbers mean when we get ride accelerations and something called jerk, which is the rate of change of acceleration, um, and, and how does that actually correspond to how a passenger experiences the ride? Uh, so we did some literature work. We did some ride trials on, on the uh, trans Pennine route between uh, Manchester and York return, and, and um, I, I actually did some of that work myself, which was quite interesting. Um, and we did some vehicle dynamic simulations as well to back that up and look at some wider issues such as track forces, um, derailment index, um, and that sort of thing. Okay, so those that aren't familiar with Ian Ride assessment methods, it's a bit dry this, but I think it's good to understand what we use today. And in fact, it's, it comes up in vehicle procurement quite often as well, where vehicles are procured. And there's, there's some discussions about what the ride comfort level should be for those new vehicles. And sometimes you get contractual problems when vehicles don't need meet ride acceptance limits for passenger comfort. So understanding these is a useful place to start. So the Ian methods, they allow you to look at ride comfort in different time durations. So principally, if you're looking at quality across a route, then you might look at the mean ride comfort, and that's analyzed in a five minute window. So that's not great for looking at discrete events. Um, it's generally, if you have a particular route, is the ride quality on this route good, then mean comfort's a good way of having a broad brush look at that. And these are weighted, frequency weighted response filters. So typically you have an MV of, well, around 1.5 is very comfortable, ranging up to 4.5 are very uncomfortable. So we've used some of these measures on the Transpennine route, so we can reveal what we think the comfort looks like on the route. As of track geometry, we did the ride test in about August, August last year. So pretty up to date. Uh, then moving on, you can look at, at shorter durations. So you might then capture a transition. You're looking at a five-second window. And in, in this, you're, you're looking more specifically at discrete features can have an influence in that five-second window. So it's a little bit more of a useful measure from our perspective. Again, the similar sort of indices are expressed as comfortable, very comfortable, medium, less comfortable, etc. cetera. Uh, moving on to discrete events. So it's quite important to understand the passenger's response to a discrete event, and by that I mean it could be a lateral alignment fault going through S and C, um, and the perception of the passenger in terms of that acceleration, that discrete acceleration, is actually affected by the cant deficiency, the, the, the steady state acceleration at any given curve. And again, this is based on BR research, and it's now implemented as the discrete events analysis in the EN standard. And what this means is 
um, you, you look at the steady state curve acceleration, so we have Kant efficiency of, say, 100 millimeters, for instance, and for a given uh, lateral acceleration discrete event, so you can see down here, we've got, this, we've got a 35% G lateral acceleration here. As the Kant efficiency goes up, these lines indicate the number of dissatisfied passengers. So it's, 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 it's not an absolute, but say you had 100, 100 passengers on a coach, you'd expect them, 50% of them to be dissatisfied if you ask them about the ride if you, if you transitioned one of these particular curves. So you can see here, this is Kant efficiency effectively on this scale. So as Kant efficiency goes up, for a given discrete event, at very low levels of Kant efficiency, only 20% of the occupants might complain. But as we move up the Kant efficiency, then 50, 60, 70, 80% of those passengers might complain about that discrete defect. And obviously, that's a big concern for the TRU team, Transplane Iron Route Upgrades team, is that if we're running at higher Kant efficiency, are we going to see more likelihood of passengers saying, oh, this ride's actually really bad, now you've changed the track, why, why did you do that? Um, so so that this work is really backing up that design element. So one of the things we found, actually, was through the literature review, we did quite a, a ranging literature review, because we found this problem ourselves when doing simulation work, is we'll have a number comes out of a simulation, it might be one and a half metres per second squared or a jerk rate of two metres per second cube. Well, this, what does that really mean? And that, there's been a lot of different bodies of research work done. Um, and the problem with that is you can actually almost get any answer you want within a range. So, for instance, we found papers which were quoting comfort levels for lateral accelerations of between 0 0.5 and one and a half metres per second squared for jerk, um, ranges from 0.5 to two metres per second cubed. So that, that's, that's quite a wide range, really, when you're trying to come up with a subjective measure for, for this particular project. So really, the findings of the literature review was that it wasn't very useful. <laughs> and we thought, well, what we... <laughs> but but, <laughs> but we'd, we'd kind of anticipated this might be the, the problem with, with this kind of review, because we have looked at it in the past. So we said, OK, well, let's just benchmark what we've already got. We've got a railway that's existing. We're going to change a few of the curves on it. So why not just use that? and see what ride acceleration levels we get, use the comfort measures and say, OK, the benchmark is what we already have. So that's, in essence, what we did. Um, we worked with our friends at, um, at TransPennine Express, and they gave us, eventually, there's no one from TPE here, it's quite difficult working with train operating companies sometimes, but they did provide us access to a vehicle, and very kindly, one of their staff to accompany us and get us into the seats and sort of bash the passengers out of the way, that sort of thing. And uh, we managed to instrument uh, two, two vehicles, one outbound from um, Manchester, Victoria to York. Um, I was the test engineer, you'll see some quotes. I came up with my own index of ride comfort. So this is sort of the, the Allen index, if you like, that I'll present the results for. <laughs> I had a button which I pressed when I felt the ride was across three levels of effectively red, amber, green, if you like. Um, a bit of a rag rating for ride comfort, so I had a button I could press with that. We kind of knew the location. We couldn't get a GPS signal. They're like a Faraday cage, the class 185s. We just can't, we can't get a GPS signal. We had two aerials, all sorts. But no, we couldn't get a GPS, which was frustrating. But um, we did still measure accelerations in three axes, and we did have um, the Allen index, if you like. <laughs> um, so, and we could correlate that back to the EN through the analysis. So it did prove very, very useful. Um, Actually, you can see my ride index is one, one and a half, and two. I, I kind of put the one and a half in the middle after I'd experienced one and two. I thought that the levels kind of evolved as, um, as we went to York and back. And interestingly, again, we kind of thought this would be a factor. Um, those that are familiar with vehicle dynamics would, would understand this, but uh, we couldn't really predict exactly where we wanted to sit on the train. We would have, we would have liked to have had over the bogey pivots for both journeys, because that's where the ride is worse. So letting you secrets here. If you want the most comfy seats, sit in the middle of the carriage, because then you get the mean of the, all the accelerations effectively. So outbound, we, um, we sat over the lead bogey, um, but inbound back from York to Manchester, Victoria, we sat between the bogeys. And, and actually, that comes out in the results. Um, mm. You could interpret and say the ride quality was much worse between York and Manchester, but we didn't see any reason why that should be the case. So we're pretty certain it's because of the position we're sat in the vehicle. 
Okay, so I'm just going to give you a flavour of the results. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these in massive detail, but um, this is for the complete run from Manchester, Victoria to York um, for the mean ride comfort. So that's over a, a five-minute uh, window of analysis. And the average was 2.3. So you can see that falls in the medium, uh, sorry, in the comfortable range. Um, so you can see immediately, you know, most people's responses, oh, it's comfortable. Okay, good. Is that good? I think so. <laughs> it is quite subjective. Um, but nonetheless, it is rated as comfortable. Um, the maximum we saw in mean ride comfort was 2.6 or 2.7. So just about in the medium comfort range. So you can see it doesn't tell you that much, really. It says, yeah, it's pretty comfortable, you know, carry on. And there's a bit of a, a breakdown here of, of how those work out statistically, but we don't talk so much. So then uh, looking at continuous comfort, this is a five-second window. So you're kind of zooming in a little bit more on the track um, when you're looking at a five-second window. So you can see it starts to reel a little... Oh, sorry, I keep pressing my uh, slide instead of my laser. Um, so, yeah, you, um, you can see you're starting to get a little bit of a different scene now. You can see the average was about 0.1, so that equates to very comfortable, which is good. Um, but the maximum value now is 0.5, um, and you see that's less comfortable. That's actually the worst comfort rating in the EN. So that's probably because that five-second window has seen some discrete feature, or we've gone through a S&C crossover or something like that. But nonetheless, you start to see something that's useful, I think, in terms of this study. It's a very different answer from, from what we got with the, the uh, mean comfort. Um, and then you can see the, the breakdown of the routes here. So still 91% of the route was very comfortable, but you can see we're starting to get a little bit more distribution between medium and less comfortable. Um, and note you can see here the differences between the, the Manchester to York and the York to um, Manchester. There's a there's definite reduction in ride quality. And as I say, we think that's because we were sat in different places on the vehicle. Um, OK, so the final measure is um, discrete events in terms of the EN. And again, this is quite interesting. You can, you can see that... So occurrences are defined as in when we... So we've got a two-second window. Um, and if we don't have any dissatisfied customers, if you like, then there's just not a result for that. It's zero. So where we've got an occurrence, that means we have a non-zero value of dissatisfied customers, um, passengers, I should say. Um, so you can see there's 57 occurrences between Manchester, Victoria and York, where there was some level of passenger discomfort on that chart. So we weren't in the sort of the bottom left triangle of the, that, the graph I showed you. We're, we're kind of picking up some levels of dissatisfaction. Um, and the maximum value was 11%. Uh, this is for seated passengers. But you can see that goes up. The index is different for standing passengers. Uh, you don't tend to get that much. And standing, well, it is relevant to Transpen. I, mean, we normally, well, I normally get a seat on the way to work, but some trains are very packed, which is pretty good, actually, from that perspective. So, so there is some relevance to that. But yeah, again, you can see there's a big difference between the two, the two routes, 57 occurrences and six occurrences. OK, so. Um, uh, moving on to the, these are our own measures, if you like. We added these into the project because we found them useful in past assessments of passenger ride comfort. So jerk is how quickly is the acceleration changing from one value to another. So the rate of change of acceleration. Um, and you can see these do tie back to the literature review. So it was useful in some respects because if we'd not done the literature review, we wouldn't have known what 1.8 was at all. But at least we know it falls in the range and it is towards the higher end. So we are getting some significant lateral jerks. I'm focusing on lateral here because it was a curving study, really. We were looking at curving effects. We have done some looking at the vertical element, but it wasn't the focus of this work. So all this really is about the lateral acceleration. So when you're trying to write or use your laptop or whatever, the ones that annoy you, or well, annoy me anyway. <laughs> OK, so um, you can see here, there's the, again, there's this, this sort of higher values with the uh, Manchester to York section. Um, but we're getting quite significant jerks of 1.8. Literature was up to about 2. Um, and then sort of the, uh, the Allen index, if you like. Um, I, I developed this uh, sort of 1, 1.5 and, and 2. And I, I see, I'm kind of blind. I'm just sat there and I'm just pressing a button when I feel it's uncomfortable. And actually, I was quite pleased with the way it correlated. You might not be able to see it very well here, but you can see the peaks 
This is the index value here, so that's a one. You know, that's a low, that's a, that's a not too bad, and then a two is, is pretty bad, and a one and a half. And you can see my button presses here, the blue line, is there just to spike uh, in the voltage signal. So you can see they do correlate quite well to the peaks, so I wasn't just kind of nodded off and pressing it by mistake. Although that was quite easy to fall asleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so that actually worked really well, and, it, and, it, and we handed that data back to Network Rail, although it wasn't part of the project. We're looking at the design, and I'll show you the next part of the presentation is about, well, what, what changed when we went to exceptional curving rules. But this gave us the picture of what the existing um, route looked like. And obviously, Network Rail have some known poor riding sites, and this data was quite valuable for them to understand what levels of acceleration they're getting in terms of the EN methods, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so moving on to sort of the desktop study, really. Um, we've used Vampire for quite a long time now, so we have a model of the Class 185, um, and we did some Vampire Vehicle Dynamics Simulation modelling. For those that aren't familiar with Vampire, it's a Vehicle Dynamics Simulation package. We modelled a certain uh, setup of the vehicle, and we basically simulated the outputs which we'd processed on the ride tests. So we had simulated outputs for accelerations and jerk and the E and ride comfort measures, and because we're in simulation land, we can then check the effect on track forces and track wear indexes and uh, track damage um, mechanisms driven by the energy in the contact patch, which is, we call it T-gamma. And we also had a quick look at derailment risk just to, to finish the job, if you like. Okay, so just so you know a little bit about what we mean in terms of exceptional des design rules, as I said before, it's about running at higher cant efficiency and higher levels of installed cant. Um, not necessarily mean, and actually for this, this curve site just outside Victoria Station, um, the curve radius was actually eased. So this is curvature on the left hand axis here, and you can see the existing route is in blue, so it was actually a tighter curve, um, and the new revised curve was of a smaller, larger radius, higher curvature. And you can see the difference in transition design. The transitions are, are a, a different rate of gain of uh, cant effectively. But here, the dotted grey line is the old line speed to the old curve, which was 30 miles an hour. And this gray, the, the solid grey line here is the revised speed, which is 55. So we're going from 30 to 55 miles an hour at this particular site. And you can see the rest of the geometry was the same. So we're overlaying here, actually, track recording coach data um, against design, CAD design data from, from David, actually, here. So it's quite handy. He'll tell me if I've done anything wrong. <laughs> a bit late now. Uh, so <laughs> we, um, we over you can see how nicely they overlay, actually. There's some filtering effects on the, t the, the track recording vehicle, um, but generally speaking, you can see how nicely that all lines up. But the key takeaway really is the difference in speed. <coughs> okay, so we did do a little bit of verification of the simulation outputs. Um, these, are, these are the overlays of the simulations against the measured data for acceleration. So this is the accelerations measured with the accelerometers on the class 185, mapped against the accelerations from our simulations. So there are some differences, but these are generally speaking where the vehicle is not traveling at the line speed. So we can't control what speed the actual test train is going to, because it's a service train. It just travels at whatever it has to, as a signal it stops. So we do get some changes here. These, we, we don't tend to look at the higher frequency stuff for this, this. We're more looking at the long wavelength alignment of these signals, which actually maps really well. We're very happy with the way the model responded um, uh, to the, to the uh, track alignment. So, so just to clarify, so the, the simulation used track recording coach data measured in May last year, and that's mapped against the ride test from, from August. So, so we're pretty confident they hadn't realigned it in that amount of time, despite some of the earlier presentations. OK, so um, just to say you know what lateral alignment looks like, uh, sorry, lateral accelerations look like from simulations and why it's useful. Um, this uh, is the existing and modified geometry. So we've got the curvature. Again, you can see here the, the differences in the site curvature, difference in cant design. And then you can see this is the lateral acceleration of the vehicle. This is all in simulation. And you can see here, this is in meters per second squared, but you can see this steady state cant deficiency effectively. You can see that, that we're running at higher speed because we've got a higher lateral acceleration and we've got higher cant deficiency. That's the whole purpose of this study, really. What does that do? What does that difference do to passenger comfort and how does it affect the vehicle's response to lateral irregularities? And equally, this is jerk, so rate of change. 
And you can see here um, that there are differences in the transitions. There is more jerk in the transitions because we are approaching the transitions at higher speed and different transition geometry. So it's nice for, for Network Rails design team. You can actually see how are their design rules on the piece of paper that's just done in CAD. What does that actually do to the vehicle? And that's one of the advantages of vehicle dynamic simulations. You can actually say, well, OK, what does it do on the ground? What does it really do? So you can see that there. <coughs> Um, so we've had a lot of talk about maintenance and track quality. Obviously, it's very important, and it really drives the vehicle's response. Um, so what we can do in simulation land is we can switch irregularities on and off so we can see the effect of them and how they affect a different sort of design. So in this case, we can, and we can also reverse engineer it. So we can, we can look at what, the, what are the maintenance limits for a given line speed. Um, for instance, here we've got network rails table for maintenance intervention limits for different speeds. So we're working in this column here, effectively, for this study, uh, between 50 and 75 miles an hour. So the maintenance intervention limit is 16 millimetres for alignment. Um, so uh, beyond that, we obviously assume something should be done to the track, but how does that affect passenger comfort? So what we did was we effectively took the track geometry, we took a nice bit of track geometry, we found a nice bit in the in the measured NMT data, and then we scaled that to different levels. And we scaled it until the passenger comfort went beyond one of our measures. So then we could start to relate passenger comfort to the maintenance intervention limits. So here you can see this is our continuous comfort, EN continuous comfort measure, the two second window. Um, and those are the describers, if you like, for that method. You know, we, if we go point two is comfortable, medium, less comfortable. And then we can plot that against the peak lateral alignment that we generated from the actual data, but we'd scaled it. And actually, it worked out quite nicely <laughs> for once. Um, so when you get to the 16 millimetre intervention limit, that's just on the threshold of reaching medium, dropping from comfortable to medium comfort. So that was quite nice. We, my colleague Adam, and I should have credited Adam, we worked together on this project. He was on the side. So Adam Bevan and I, we, we kind of smiled to each other when we saw that. We didn't even fix it or anything. So, so yeah, that, that, that came in at 60 mil. And then we looked at jerk. So obviously we've looked at the literature review in terms of the jerk accelerations as well. And we plot the, the jerk meters per second cube. And actually, if you look at sort of 16, this intervention limit here, it's a bit over one, sort of 1.1, 1.2, which is again is kind of the lower level of the, the, the perception of poor comfort from a jerk perspective. So we could pretty much say that if if we maintain the track, we don't do anything too special, but we do make sure we keep the track within the, the, the sort of lower level interventions, then we should be okay with this geometry. You know, if we let the alignment quality degrade, then we start to get problems because we're running at higher cant efficiency and the train is running faster over those irregularities. Um, in fact, you can see that from this, this is why I included this top table here. Um, with irregularities, the modified geometry is actually worse than the existing. And that's because at the site we were actually working at, the geometry was very poor for various reasons. It was a site of low track quality. So again, that was a bonus for us from a simulation perspective, because it gave us that insight immediately that actually, if you do have very poor alignment, so we, I think we were, we were way, I think we were about 24 or something like that, a lateral alignment fault um, for, the, for the measured data in May. Um, but if you take out irregularities, switch them off and just purely look at the design that was, was done by Network Rail, um, then they're very similar, really, the comfort levels. So the, the passage of comfort has been, from an exceptional values perspective, is not being driven by the changes to the alignment done on a, the CAD drawings. It's been driven by the effect of the irregularities that are superimposed on that. Um, so it is sort of, I think, considering track quality is, is really important. Um, so equally, um, we could then look at, well, what's if we're running at high cant efficiency, so obviously we're expecting track shifting forces to go up. You know, it's a circular curve, we're going around a circular curve more quickly. The lateral accelerations are higher, so obviously the lateral forces on the track will be higher. And, and we did find, of course, that was the case. Gauge spreading forces reduce a little bit because you're putting more force on the high rail. Um, vertical forces increase a little bit as, as well because you're effectively the vehicle is compressed more into, towards the ballast. Um, so we, we drew those out. Um, T gamma, I think from memory, 
Yeah, it improves because one of those that have been involved with rolling contact fatigue know one of the primary mitigations for rolling contact fatigue is to run at higher cant efficiency. So this is like a RCF friendly track design, um, I think is the simplest way of expressing it. And really we looked at derailment indices, but there was nothing really very exciting going on there. We wouldn't expect there to be. Okay, so um, to conclude, um, as I said, we've measured the right of data um, on the existing route, and it's provided really good reference material. So I'm sure Network Rail would be happy to share this data with other people that are interested in the ride quality on their routes or redesigns, etc. There's been some good learning, I think, in terms of what these numbers mean um, to passenger comfort. Um, so uh, increased design cant gradients result in slightly higher peak jerk rates. You saw that in the slide I showed you with the jerk rate. So the design does slightly increase the jerk in the transitions, but not massively so. The increased steady state lateral acceleration is the cant efficiency do not significantly degrade the passenger comfort. That doesn't really change anything too much. We're not really ramping that up massively. And in fact, in mainland Europe, they, um, they run it typically at 150 mil deficiency all the time. Um, but it did, it did draw out that because you're running at a higher speed, we're not running at 30 mile an hour on that curve now, we're running at 55. So if you do have shorter wavelength irregularities, obviously they are going to be amplified. You, you're running over them faster, and typically that will lead to higher lateral accelerations and jerk. Uh, increases in track shifting forces and peak rail forces were predicted. Again, that's, that wasn't a surprise, but it was nice to quantify them. And we weren't worried about derailment um, indices going up. <coughs> so what were the recommendations? Well, it's easier for me to say if someone doesn't maintain the track. <laughs> but the obvious thing from an engineer's perception, while well, the track bed formation, obviously we want to make that a high quality design in the outset. So we want to have the right track form make sure there's no residual uh, foundation issues or that sort of thing. There's, there's, um, there's other universities better placed than ourselves so once we're below the rail level. But, um, but I think the track form, et cetera, is, is something that, that needs to be looked at. And not only will this achieve good as-built geometry, but it also helps maintain that quality level. So what the key message is, you, you run at high canvas, you run at higher speeds, but maintain the track quality. So we're asking those regions to sort of focus on track quality, keep it within the maintenance limits. And we've kind of identified <coughs> 16 millimetres as, that, as a sensible intervention limit for this particular curve. Um, so, so that if I explain, and, and, and finally, good track form construction practice and will also help the ongoing maintenance um, and also help mitigate against increased track shifting forces, because obviously we don't want a poor installation, and we've got increased track shifting forces, and then you need to realign tamp more often. So again, it also just goes back to that um, maintenance and installation being good. Okay, I think. Oh no, I'm gonna. I've got one more slide. It's an advert. Oh no, no, no I don't mean an advert. So we've got some, <laughs> we've got some new, um, new exciting uh, equipment. Um, coming in to support this sort of work. So one of the things, as, as I say, we've, we've come across in the past when we've worked with, with other operators is that going from numerical values to actual um, ride comfort experience and understanding the human perception of ride is really difficult. So we did it, you know, I ran on a real train and you can't always get that access. And obviously that's just my perception. So we've, um, we've commissioned a, a six axis platform um, a high fidelity motion platform. We've worked really hard with these people on the motion and queuing because one of the subtleties of railway vehicle dynamics is that the accelerations are quite small. So motion simulations are quite often used in aerospace and you've got very big movements, etc. Um, but in rail, it's not like that. So if you want to know the difference between one geometry and another and actually sit on it and feel the difference of transition design, then you need to get the motion and queuing absolutely spot on. And... Um, Within that, we also then created an environment which is obviously quite realistic in terms of a train interior. So it opens up other opportunities to investigate um, how you might uh, look at the ride comfort within a vehicle. I think I was chatting to someone uh, this morning and I was thinking, well, actually, another thing, what, has it got a toilet in there? And I was like, well, no, but maybe we should. And it does look a bit like a portaloo, I thought. <laughs> I didn't, I, my, my colleague was a little bit upset when I, when I said that to him, but um, that designed it. Um, 
but actually you could because it does slosh around quite a lot, doesn't it? And it's quite often you get a little bit worried, you know, you get big lateral alignment, it's a bit full over the normal level. And you think, oh, I need to, I need to step away. So, so I think, you know, maybe there is some research to be done here with toilet manufacturers. We can give them the worst possible uh, track alignment and see if things stay, you know, where they should. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's something that's going to be of use to us in the future. And, and anyone that wants to come and visit the university, please feel free. We'll show you around. We'll give you a ride on Transpennine route upgrade, and you can decide which, which alignment you like the best. I came off. On that note, I'll... Uh, I'll <coughs>